I don't think Carl needs much introduction to this group. I wanted to say that I am doubly excited about this meeting. One, because I know Carl to be such an avid and thorough scholar of Dickens. And the second is that Carl in his secret life is none other than Christopher Lloyd. His books include Scene of the Crime, the first. These are all mysteries. The Our Mutual Friend Murders and Oliver Twist Murders. I think I reversed those in order. And I found that these are all uh, well received. If I'm correctly, Oliver Twist includes a map and a floor plan. Is that correct? Well, uh, the two are the two that are actually published are Christmas Carol Murders and Edwin Drood Murders, and okay. definitely the Edwin Drood Murders has a map of the hotel in which. Okay, the, I got the, it mixed up here. That's okay. Yes. Good. Yes. Let's see. Okay, to say your favorite detective writer is Ruth Rendell. Correct. And you gave several night names as your favorite detective. Possibly including Miss Marple. So I wanted to ask you what you thought about Margaret Rutherford's performance in several Agatha Christie based movies. I liked her until I saw anyone else play the part. I see. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'd have to settle on, uh, oh my God, I've forgotten her name from the 80s. Um, I've, I've forgotten her name. I'm ashamed, but all of the three marples that were uh, from the 80s and then the, in the aughts when they redid the marples, I liked better. Even in the, even in the marple murders, even in the adaptations that uh, included books in which she never appeared until they adapted the book. And I haven't researched this, but I noticed that Edwin Drood has been dramatized or made into movies several times. And it is also a very successful Broadway musical. It's true. It's, uh, there are at least two versions that are available. Uh, Megan Kelly has been researching potentially earlier ones that have been lost, but there is a 1930s version with Claude Rains playing Jasper. And then there's a, two, and then there's a 2012 adaptation that was done on Masterpiece Theater that I am I'm waiting for the DVD to arrive. I haven't seen it since it was released. That has a quite unusual solution to the story. Great, great. Well, you've already mentioned that you retired from the insurance business. Yeah. You were in fact an insurance executive. It's true. But I wanted to ask you, was the name of the company possibly the disinterested loan and Sorry, the Anglo Bengali Disinterested Loan and Assurance Company. No, I spent, I spent 30 years working exclusively for a workers' compensation insurance oh, company. Great. So, no life insurance, no, no sketchy contracts. And you mentioned these seminars that you conduct. I saw that you are connected to the literary arts. I do. Uh, yes. Yeah, I do facilitate a book discussions very similar to these as we're, I'm going to, what I'm going to run today. And I've done 15 or 16 dead white guys. Uh, I've done several Dickens, most of Forster, uh, just finished Vanity Fair. I've done one on the history of detective fiction. Um, I have done a couple of Thomas Hardy, uh, I'm thinking about doing Edwin Drew later this year because I've had such fun getting ready for this. But yes, that's what I do in my retirement. <clears throat> Great. I was very pleased to see that you mentioned that E.M. Forster may be the five favorite or among your favorite novels. Absolutely. I think he is, uh, he is crazy good at the use of life symbols in, rec in not not overworking his symbolism the way Nathaniel Hawthorne might, but just making, 
Uh, in much the same way, for example, in Barnaby Rudge, if you remember, the Maypole stands for the for England itself and all of its stolidity and uh, stability. In that sense, uh, Howard's end is so obviously England, uh, and the battle to be the battle to fight for who is going to take over Howard's end. The intellectuals, uh, the intelligentsia, or the working class and. Forrester surprisingly, I think, ends the novel in an unexpected way. I was interested, I was still in college when Morris was finally published, I think in 1970. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, I, of course, I've read reviews and criticism. It was interesting to see the homophobia that came out of these distinguished and well-educated critics. <laughs> Yes, that was the first uh, the first Forrester seminar that I did was on Morris, and uh, I read the scathing Cynthia Ozick uh, review. I mean, one of <clears throat> United States great intellectuals. But um, well, thank you for that, uh, Courtney. Are you ready to to give us a, an administrative learning? Sure. So welcome everyone. We're we're so glad to have you here with us. Um, so. Um, Everyone is currently muted. Um, when you have something that you'd like to say or a question that you'd like to ask, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Um, I can see most of you on my screen, but if you're waving your hand, I might miss you. So the place to find the, the raise hand feature um, is at the bottom of the screen, there's a menu and one of the, the items is called reactions. And if you click on that, there's a raise hand. So just click that and you'll be added to our queue and we'll keep an eye on, on you um, and, and ask you to unmute when, when it's your turn. All right, great. <clears throat> so as some of you heard earlier, I have read all of Dickens novels many times, but Edwin Drood was the last Dickens novel that I read and I was in my mid twenties and I didn't see the point in reading a book that Dickens hadn't bothered to finish. Well, okay, so he died. But in any case, uh, in 1981 or 1982, I was in a Walden Books or a, or a B. Dalton or some strip mall bookstore and I found a copy of The Mystery of Edwin Drood completed by Leon Garfield. First of all, I couldn't believe that I saw a book like that in a strip mall bookstore, so I bought it and decided it was finally time to read Edwin Drood. And after reading that completion and then rereading the original, I, I'm not sure I became a Drudist at the level that John describes, but I became interested enough that when I decided to start writing uh, the mystery novels in 2012, I knew that I wanted to first write about the Christmas Carol, so, so a Christmas Carol. So I wrote the Christmas Carol Murders and then I knew because I had just finished doing one of these kinds of discussions on the history of the detective novel, starting with um, after doing Auguste Dupin and the Purloined Letter and uh, the uh, Murders in the Room Morgue, I focused for three weeks on The Moonstone, which many people think was the first and still the best detective novel. And I happen to be one of those people. So I decided that Edwin Drood would be my second novel or based on my, my second novel was going to be based on Edwin Drood because I really believe that Dickens had been frustrated at the end of his life. He was being very successful as the publisher of a weekly publication all the year round. And then he agreed to publish Wilkie Collins's The Moonstone. Now admittedly, he didn't like parts of it. But apparently in the case of the Moonstone, unlike many of the other contributors to All the Year Round, Dickens didn't fiddle with the story in quite the same way that he did with some of the others. And if you, if you do read the introduction to the, the, the Penguin classics, you'll find out about some of that fiddling in, in the case of a different novel. But I'm pretty sure that, that Dickens was jealous of Collins's success and decided perhaps that his next book was going to be an attempt to show Wilkie Collins, his younger protege, who was still the master of the hounds. And so he started, I think he started Edwin Drood in the hopes that it would 
be successful. I'm not going to go through a lot of the biographical stuff. Again, it's very well covered in the Penguin introduction regarding the contracts that he signed and the decision to make this book shorter than Our Mutual Friend and many of the others. So let's get started. If you've read a lot of Dickens, you know that, <clears throat> excuse me, that opening chapters are always important, no matter what book you read, but particularly in Dickens. And he opens his novels in a wide variety of ways, but there is simply nothing like the opening of the mystery of Edwin Drood. Megan Kelly, are you around? Would you be willing to read the opening paragraph of chapter one? You are muted, thank you. Am I still? No. Not now. Okay, chapter one, the dawn. An ancient English cathedral town. How can the ancient English cathedral town be here? The well-known massive gray square tower of its old cathedral, how can that be here? There is no spike of rusty iron in the air between the eye and it from any point of the real prospect. What is the spike that intervenes and who has set it up? Maybe it is set up by the Sultan's order for the impaling of a horde of Turkish robbers one by one. It is so, for symbols clash, and the sultan goes by to his palace in long procession. 10,000 scimitars flash in the sunlight, and thrice 10,000 dancing girls strew flowers. Then follow white elephants, comparisoned in countless gorgeous colors, and infinite in number and attendance. Still, the cathedral tower rises in the background, where it cannot be, and still, no writhing figure is on the grim spike. Stay, is the spike so low a thing as the rusty spike on the top of a post of an old bedstead that has tumbled all our eye? Some vague period of drowsy laughter must be devoted to the consideration of this possibility. Wayne, you have your hand up. You're muted. Wayne, you're, you're muted. Now, now you can hear me, I'm sorry. Yes. I was going to ask about the opening chapters because this one certainly is very dense, although I think beautiful. In Martin Chuzzlewit, he wrote a, what I would have to admit is a fairly dull opening chapter. In A Tale of Two Cities, he wrote a very difficult and uh, distinctive first chapter. I know, for example, as a teacher, high school teacher, I had to spend a little time explaining why those opening chapters were so bad, particularly since Dickens really relied on popularity. On the other hand, in uh, Great Expectations, I could simply have the students perform the first chapter. It's all right there. <laughs> A fabulous opening chapter. But that's my question. Why these confusing opening chapters? Well, for some, I'm going to turn that, open that up for uh, other points of view because it is difficult to follow. And I imagine many of you read it three or four times before you really grasped what was going on. But who would like to comment on the uh, complexity of this opening chapter? David. Okay, this is a slight, slightly off the question. I think starting with Christmas Carol and Dombey and Son, Dickens suddenly realized how much you could do with the first chapter. And from that point on, you see him thinking about it and coming up with ideas. In Little Dorrit and Our Mutual Friend, he's setting some of the themes of the novel and leaving the readers perplexed as to 
who are these people? How is this going to fit? Uh, I think he's doing something similar here. Now I'll pass to somebody else. Well, and what exactly is that that Dickens is doing in this opening paragraph and opening chapter, which is certainly unlike most of his novels? Megan. I think he's confusing. I think he's blowing smoke. I think he's taking us straight into um, Arabian Nights. I think, I think we are as unsteady in a way as John Jasper is when he awakes in his opium. It's an immediacy. It's it's right there, and it's also confusing because it's because it's confusing. He's blowing smoke. Irene. Hi, um, I just feel that uh, he he's setting the scene for what we need to understand about Jasper later on, because for many chapters after this, it, it, Jasper is more ambiguous. But right at the beginning, he's showing us what kind of guy we may be dealing with, that there are two sides to the Jasper, the one known in the cathedral town and the one that we're being introduced to here. And I think that's an important background to let us into the novel. Thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen Wright. Yeah, um, well, he's tripping actually. <laughs> yes. What's going on. And uh, I'm noticing that the, it's rather violent with the uh, spike and the impaling. So you're seeing um, a, violent, a violence in the first few words it clears up a little you know in the next paragraph in the next sentence shaking from head to foot the man whose scattered consciousness has fantastically pieced this together at length rises so yeah that that's what he's doing he's tripping on opium thank you phyllis hi thank you uh, two points. Uh, one, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the concluding quote, which I assume is about Job and um, his hope perishes and the hope of his strength vanishes. And then secondly, I'd like to have your thoughts on the recap of this scene much later in the book, um, because that scene and later in the book, you're suddenly thrown who is this woman? And then all of a sudden, this opening chapter comes back to you and you know right away where you are, which made me feel like it was one of those Dick Dickensian, put the rope up, <laughs> pull it up, throw it up again, and later on you're going to be up somewhere else. So I'd like your thoughts on either of those or both. Well, before I get to that, I want to find out what other people think. William, Bill. Hi. Um a couple of thoughts. One is that this is obviously a man who's um, grounded not only in English stuff, but also the, the traditions of the Arabian Nights and so on. Uh, he is tripping. But I think the other thing it does is it suggests the unreliability of um, eyewitness testimony and, and reports, uh, which are so central often to detective novels. That's a very interesting point of view. Thank you for that. Dorothy. You are muted, Dorothy. There, there it goes. There okay. you go. I just wanted to comment on uh, the last question the last sentence in the paragraph, which seems to be foreshadowing when the wicked man. And what would you like to say? No, it's just that it's obvious that he's dropping some hints here at the very beginning about who Jasper is. Well, I think, and I don't have the whole quote from the, from uh, the, the, the hymn that they, are going to be singing is starts when the wicked man. 
Yes, and I believe the, at the end of that phrase, the phrase is, and he will save his soul alive. And I think oh, don't that, add that I've got, and then the intoned words, when the wicked man rise among groins of arches and beams of roof, awakening muttered thunder. I think there's- I have the Oxford illustrated. Let's see here. Um, well, it's actually from Ezekiel. The, the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth, doeth that which is lawful and right, and he shall save his soul alive. And I think this is a novel about salvation, or at least um, maybe reconciliation. And the more that we get into this, and the more that we talk about the potential that this is a novel about the divided self, uh, whether the division is corporeal and spirit uh, and spiritual or evil and good or however the divide may be whether dickens knew the difference or cared about the difference i think that we are told right away that this is a book about the potential for salvation dorothy you're still your hands still up I'm finished i i just wanted to point out that because i when i saw that i thought oh wicked man and what's he going to be doing because i'd never read before thank you thank you for that so this um, this along with several other chapters in the book is told in the present tense um, much like uh, parts of bleak house and i i'm pretty sure parts of mut our mutual friend are in the present tense what does the present tense do for us in this book it's overused extensively in contemporary fiction. God knows I'm tired of reading novels that are constantly in the present tense. It it's, is an intensifier of experience and I think Dickens uses it very effectively, but what does it do for us here? Anybody? Glenna. Yeah, I read. Well, <clears throat> it, Obviously, it reinforces the immediacy, but it also reinforces the idea that we're inside Jasper's mind. It's not in the past tense. It's, you know, this is what he is experiencing in the moment. Trudy, you're muted, Trudy. Trudy, you're muted. Yeah, got it. I, uh, I was going to use the same word that Glenna used, um, that it gives it immediacy. Uh, I think the other thing, I was trying to keep track of, you know, when he went from present to past and back to present. And the, the chapters that are in the present um, make me think of uh, Dickens as the dramatist. Uh, you know, it. Uh, I think that relates to the immediacy, but it's almost as if um, you're seeing this happen, right? I think that's an excellent point. And Trudy reminded reminds me of something that I wanted to make clear to you. I would like for you, as we go forward during this, to explicitly keep track of what tense you're in and how you feel about that, because. Uh, Trudy's right on the money. There, this is an intensifying experience in this novel, and maybe we have been uh, inured to it as contemporary readers, but it wasn't common in, in the Victorian age to write in the present tense. So ask yourself what it does for you and notice when it happens and when it doesn't. Thank you very much for that, Trudy. Uh, can I, I, you know, I'd like to add, I think that I, I was going to go to this morning and check, but I ran out of time. I think that in many of the chapters where he uses the present tense, excuse me, there's more dialogue. Uh, there's more characteristics, uh, characterization by dialogue than there is by description. Well, the first five chapters are all in the present tense. And then chapter six is in six and seven are in past tense and eight is in present tense and nine is in past tense. Past tense. So there's quite a shift in this opening uh, this week. Um, 
And I, I do think that, that Dickens is using that technique to ratchet up the reader interest. And again, I, I just wanna stress that this is not, was not a common technique in the 19th century, and it probably would have affected the contemporary, the readers of Dickens' time more than it does that. Uh, the chapter does end um, with just a reminder that what it is that, that Jasper sees is the tower. And I think Dickens is, is uh, if, if you will, he is uh, so sounding his own keynote for us in this opening chapter that the cathedral tower is going to play an important role in, in the novel. So with respect to confusion, when you started chapter two, did that also confuse you? Did you even know what characters were, were, were talking and who was in the scene? I had to read it three or four times before I could sort out exactly what, what was going on. I imagined that, the, that Dickens, the point of view, the point of view thing, person, was flying over them, looking at them at the, the tops of their heads and hats as if they were blackbirds and watching them move around in the, in the cathedral area. Um, but just to make it clear, Dean and Chris Barkle are walking together and they have some dialogue and then Tope and Jasp Jasper leave the church and Jasper stays left, he goes somewhere and Tope then comes up and approaches the other two men. And this is a pretty information uh, laden chapter. Um, what if anything did uh, came to your, I mean, there are a lot of things in this chapter. It does a lot of work, but uh, what call, what came to your mind first and foremost, Maroney? You're muted. Sorry, um, just looking at it again and hadn't stuck in my head, but the, um, the titles were so confused. I mean, the, you know, your reverence, the Dean or Mr. Dean, or um, I'm trying to see if there's another one, the Verger, the, that, that added to the confusion. It really, I think the first time it, that totally confused me. The second time around, I, I knew to right away sort it out again, who, what's a title and what's a name. When I was even more confused at age 25 about the, the word chapter, because here we are reading the chapter of a novel, but Dickens's chapter title refers to the chapter, which is the collective noun for the members of the uh, clergy that are attached to the cathedral. And the dean is the administrative head of that. And Jasper is a lay presenter, which means he is not clergy. And Canon, uh, Canon Chris Barkle is simply one of many milling about clergy that are, could be in, attached to the cathedral. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Anglican church and I don't want to become one, but it, it's, you're right, it's confusing at several levels. Although I think many of Dickens's readers would have had an easier time of it than we might. Meg, uh, Irene. Yes, just to comment that for the for his original readers, I don't think this would have caused any trouble at all. You know, sort of uh, the, the English church is a state Anglican church in which everyone was, if you like, imbued and, st and, and stewed from an early age. And I think a lot of this confusion that American readers would have or modern readers would have uh, is not would not have been a problem for the contemporaries who were brought up in the Anglican church. Thank you for that. Megan. Uh, we do have the clue of, um, you know, for example, Tope is just called Tope. He's not Mr. Tope. And the Dean is the Dean. So we're given some uh, reference points to realize in the hierarchy where these people stand. Mr. Jasper is a Mr. Mr. Chris Parkle is a Mr. So that helped a little. 
And if I recall correctly, the verger's like responsible for opening the church and the sexton's responsible for the grounds and the graveyard and other things that are attached to it. Um, what else happened in the first chapter that caught your eye? Because there's, there's something really important that happens fairly early on in the chapter. Uh, Phyllis. Um, well, I don't know if I have an answer for that, but I, I do think that there's, um, uh, once again, that sense of Dickens uh, stitching um, things through that after the unintelligible uh, in the first chapter, really by the second page of the next chapter, we talk about uh, bad grammar to the laity. And then um, Mr. Tope is working his way around the sunken rocks of words that he um, doesn't handle well. Uh, but I, I get the thing that struck me the most was, was the whole pussy portrait, uncle, nephew, uh, both their fathers pledged them. And um, the whole family thing gets very confusing to me. Is he an, uh, he's an uncle, but he's not old enough to be an uncle. But then who are these fathers? And so I feel again, that image you have of the rooks flying over and, and these things going on underneath um, was going on a lot here. Well, I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't be so tied to the titles that the characters use to one another as necessarily being the accurate descriptions of who they really are. And I think for when, when Dickens points to the fact that those terms are not allowed in that room, it might be because they aren't correct. And I just, let's leave that. I don't wanna spend a lot of time as we go through the first two sessions speculating on what Dickens planned to do at the end of the novel, but there are all of these crumbs along the way. And I think that that is one of the crumbs that, that the age difference and the title, the discomfort Jasper has with the title may be nothing to do with the story itself, but maybe a clue from Dickens to the reader to pay attention to those, the disparity in their ages um, and their relationship. But I want to call attention to something that's on page 13 of the, the Penguin. And in about the middle of the page, the Dean asks, is Mr. Jasper's nephew with him? No, sir, replied the verger, but expected. There's his own solitary shadow betwixt two windows, the one looking this way and the one looking down the high street, drawing his own curtains now. Two Jaspers two windows, two directions. I think this is pretty sophisticated stuff uh, for Dickens or frankly for any other writer. And uh, this book is filled with, with doubles, twins, divided items. And I hope that you will look for them and gleefully report out next time which ones you find in the second section of the reading. Um, what kind of man is Jasper? What, what before, before the, uh, the, the portrait comes up, we see Jasper and what well, we see Jasper and Drew together. Um, what do these men look like to you? And you can draw on what you see in the illustrations as well as what Dickens portrays in the text. Everyone's so shy. That's not my experience of being at the universe. Glenna. Um, what do they look like? Well, I, I'm just struck by how strongly Rosa Bud um, is repulsed by Jasper. So there's something in his physical appearance as well as his manner that is extremely creepy to a young woman. Um, his fixity of attention on her obviously is part of it. Um, and I mean, obviously there are a lot of families where uncles, I've known of families where uncles are younger than their nephews, uh, if it's a large family, but it means that the relationship between the two of them is very ambiguous. They're relatively close in age, but yet, you know, there's a certain subordinate, superordinate. 
And if you look at the illustration, you will see that Drood is blonde and fair and Jasper is dark. And he's even described as dark with black hair and whiskers. So again, we have this, this shade of light and dark and young and not so young Wayne. Okay, sorry. Uh, that description of Jasper, for some reason, made me think of the haunted man, a character in the Christmas book by the same name. The haunted man is really a terrifying story. It's as if maybe Dickens is kind of experimenting with this idea of the double. But that's the way I see just, uh, Jasper already. And I was, I don't know if someone's mentioned that the first thing we hear about Jasper is that he has been taken. Tope says that Jasper was taken. And that suggests anything from fainting or being possessed by the devil. I don't know. Yeah, he does say so, taken by some kind of fit. Yes. But, um, let's see here. Where is that phrase? Um, what he says is, um, which was perhaps the cause of his having a kind of fit after him a little. His memory grew dazed and a dimness and giddiness crept over him as strange as ever I saw, though he didn't seem to mind it particularly himself. Pretty accurate uh, definition. For those of you who may not have read or seen uh, Dickens's fifth and final Christmas book, The Haunted Man, if you look up on the internet, there's a fabulous uh, illustration from that Christmas book that Wayne is thinking about, where you see the haunted man be, uh, you see the man, Redlaw, sitting brooding in his dark chair at the university and standing over him is a doppelganger looking as intently as the other. And so we know from, I mean, if you've, if you've read extensively that Dickens has some experience with, with this idea of doubling. Um, and so I, that's, a, that's a great observation, Wayne. Thank you. Barony. The, um, well, I, I had something that I'll go back to, but the, the, the dazed look is explained in the notes as a, a am I right in as a common after effect of opium is that do you remember that well I didn't you know I didn't study the notes extensively because I've been working in a different book for the most oh, okay part. well anyway anyway that that it that it's an expected um well, I, I don't know what else to call it, you know, an, an after effect that, that can come days after <laughs> um, he's partaken, although it looks like he partakes a lot. Um, the, and again, I'm sorry, this is a question rather than, um, is it, and I'm reading too much Dickens at once, is it in this book where Jasper asked Edwin not to call him uncle? That's right. It's in, yes, it's right up front. Yes. And um, I mean, that that's the age difference is, is not tremendous, but also his um, his state of mind, you know, I, I don't, lack of maturity or something, you know, that he doesn't want, he is the older one and he is an uncle, but he doesn't, he doesn't embrace that. And my calculations suggest that they're about six years apart. Jasper's 26 and Drood is either 19 or 20. He has not yet achieved his majority. I think that's what's important to remember here. Dan Stewart. 
Yeah, back to Wayne's point. Uh, that's not the first time Dickens uses that rhetorical device took or taken. In Bleak House, Skimpole is took, and really nobody understands what it means until they actually see he's been uh, arrested for debt. And um, it's very interesting that he uses this same rhetorical device in kind of a different way to kind of possess someone, or at least in, in some kind of metaphorical way, who may not be the most reputable character. Um, definitely Jasper, as it turns out, is, is suspect. And of course, Skimpole in that book um, is, is kind of a, well, a baddie. But um, I, I like the way that that, that, that wording um, comes across in multiple novels, and especially in this novel as it relates to really Jasper, who, who's kind of the primary character, even though he's a more or less a villain. Well, the conversation, I think the dialogue between the two of them is odd for any novel, but particularly odd for um, a Dickens novel, but I'll go ahead and Phyllis, you have something. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that um, there's a similarity uh, and a brotherhood between Jasper um, and his nephew, uh, which is that they both feel stuck in a bargain not of their own choosing. Um, he, Jasper feels he's grinding the music, which I love the idea of grinding as thinking about the uh, grinder <laughs> uh, earlier in another novel. And then, um, and then of course, uh, Drew is stuck in this agreement that he had no um, party to. And uh, I think they're closer to one another. And then finally, the, the, this has probably been written about so many times, but there's in the beginning of chapter three, um, Dickens ticks us through the, the history, the Druids, the Romans, the Saxons, the Normans. And I guess Druid, is that an, uh, an allusion to Druid? I mean, I assume that's part of this. Um, but that also the whole idea of what is England, what you we were talking about earlier with Forster and the symbolism that can be lightly used to, have, to uh, describe heavy thoughts. Uh, seems like that's going on here a little bit too. Well, I do, I do think that the point, my, my take on this is that Rochester Cathedral is fricking old. It is so old that parts of it have seeped into other buildings. That's one of those magnificent moments where, you know, Dickens personifies things and uh, turns people into objects. It's, it's so common everywhere you look. But it's clear that this this cathedral and its oppressiveness, possibly its religion, which Dickens was no fan of, uh, is seeping into the very the very buildings and the very homes, if you will, of the people in uh, Cloisterham. Sylvia, you're muted. You're muted, dear. You're muted. We can't hear you, Sylvia. Sylvia, we cannot hear you. Right, yes, uh, hello. Um, yes, I, I know Rochester a little bit and I think Dickens was just really enjoying himself describing Rochester when he describes all the history because that's what does it does exist uh, and th then he goes into the cathedral after that you know but the history and the Romans and the medieval and the monks he was describing his hometown he, he spent his much of his childhood there his father yeah. was clerk in the navy not necessarily country. meaning symbolism he was just enjoying describing what he loved. And he died at Gads Hill, which is only a few miles outside of Rochester. Um, that's a very good point. Thank and you. And the so night before he died, he actually walked um, behind the, the cathedral amongst where the monks used to be. Um, in the, I think it's called the Vines. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I I found what you were saying about the you know it's being so old, old, old. Uh, in these in this first section, um, he really emphasizes that, and not in a positive way of of cherishing tradition, 
but it's almost, uh, you know, it's a place where the dead are, right? <laughs> but it's almost as if the cathedral itself represents something um, sort of dead. There's a one, uh, toward the end, there's a wonderful comparison he makes uh, between, um, oh, geez, where is it? It's very close here. It's on page 94 in the Penguin, right? Uh, old time heaved a moldy sigh from tomb and arch and vault, and gloomy shadows began to deepen in corners. <coughs> Dance began to, and damps began to rise from green patches of stone and so on. And then he says at the end, in the free outer air, the river, the green pastures, and the brown arable lands, the teeming hills and dales were reddened by the sunset. While the, and, and so, and, I mean, there's a definite contrast, right, between something that is death like and something that is very much alive. And then I can't remember where it is, but he has the little comment about the railroad and that the fact that the railroad, uh, you know, bypassed. <laughs> I mean, it was there, right? But you couldn't get into, you couldn't get in there uh, with, by rail. You had to get in the way uh, Mr. Honey Thunder and, and uh, Neville and, um, uh, God, what's my problem with her name? Get in, right? Uh, it's, and I tend to think of Dickens as not being real fond of the railroad, but it, but it seems to me that he is contrasting something that needs to be left or abandoned, or that he there's an idea that you have to move forward to life, and that that and that the cathedral does represents the opposite of life. Thank you. Bill Jordan, do you have your Penguin edition with you? Are you still with us, Bill? I thought you were. Yeah, he is. Yes. Uh, would you uh, turn to page 25? Excuse me, page 24 and read the paragraph that starts as in some cases. Well, read, uh, don't read all of it, but read about half of it. I'll tell you when okay. to stop. As in some cases of drunkenness and in others of animal magnetism, there are two states of consciousness which never clash, but each of which pursues its separate course as though it were continuous instead of broken. Thus, if I hide my watch when I'm drunk, I must be drunk again before I can remember where. So, Miss Twinkleton, has two distinct and separate phases of being. Every night, the moment the young ladies have retired to rest, does Miss Twinkleton smarten up her curls a little, brighten up her eyes a little, and become a sprightly Miss Twinkleton, whom the young ladies have never seen. Every night at the same hour does Miss Twinkleton resume the topics of the previous night comprehending the tender scandal of Cloisterham, of which she has no knowledge whatever by day, and references to a certain season at Tunbridge Wells, airily called by Miss Twinkleton in this state of existence, the Wells. Notably, the season wherein a certain finished gentleman, compassionately called by Miss Twinkleton in this state of her existence, foolish Mr. Porters revealed a homage of the heart, whereof Miss Twinkleton, in her scholastic state of existence, is as ignorant as a granite pillar. Thanks. All right, what's going on in this little paragraph? Anybody? Glenna. There. Um, well, I, I'm really struck, even though, even though I knew what you were suggesting about the uh, Jasper as a dual nature, I, and I read it with that in mind, 
I still missed a lot of this stuff. And I mean, this is an extraordinary passage if you're really thinking about the possibility that Jasper is a divided self. It's a brilliant description of a woman who, for professional reasons, has to maintain this utterly, um, you know, all living in her mind uh, persona. But then when she gets a chance, she can be more human. And it, it's both realistic and yet, I mean, because there are a lot of people who live their lives that way, but it also, so, I mean, all these clues that are being dropped and I was too dumb to notice them. Thank you, Carl. Well, I would hardly say that you were too dumb, Glenna. You're quite an accomplished scholar yourself, but I think that you underscore two of the, the great reasons for doing book groups book groups like this, as opposed to ones where you drink wine and talk about your grandchildren, is that reading a book multiple times and reading it in community is bound to tap into the experiences and insights of people who are not you, who have not lived your life and therefore may not see everything the way that you do. So you're, you're not at all stupid. In fact, I met you, know you well enough to know that that's entirely not true. Marini. The, the, I helped myself because when, when we read Drew with the moonstone at the universe, um, I marked this passage with the moonstone. Um, you know, the, anyway, the, I won't spoil it for people who haven't read it, but the business of if you've done something when you're in an altered state, you need to be in an altered state to to find it or recreate it. What confuses me about it, though, is are we meant to think that Miss Twinkleton they even have question marks all over the it, it, it is she taking something or is she schizoid or I mean what I, I love what was just said about that she's a dual personality but the business of her not remembering I mean that's that's sounds like an altered state either from mental illness or drink or drugs to me and I don't think it's explained well, I'll see what Bill, Bill and Cynthia, uh, the Pattersons have to say or, but after Bill, and then we'll see what, or, whether we, I, you, you need a further explanation after they've talked Bill. <laughs> well, um, I think the, the duality that is attributed to uh, Miss Twinkleton is between the sort of propriety um, required of a, a woman who's instructing uh, girls and can't imagine uh, that they would ever have any kind of sexual desire and her own um, sort of other released sexual desire. And it, it sort of strikes me that that same um, duality plays out in one of her students uh, who's called both Rosa Bud and Pussy. And so um, I, I'm thinking there's some sexual tension here. Interesting. Uh, the Petersons. Oh, yeah, this is Sterney. But um, I, uh, well, as far as whether she is um, unaware, I, I kind of have a feeling she's probably not really very reliable. She probably just isn't going to admit that she has this other part of her life, especially around all these girls and stuff like that. But maybe she is unaware. I also thought, you know, the the thing about Porter's, the reasoning, Mr. Porter's, and that is the Elliotson's um, story about the drunken Porter, that is the, the um, thing about doing something when you're in an altered state of consciousness and you have to be in that altered state to, to remember doing it. Or, and it happens to be a drunken Porter. And of course, it, this little, it's not much, but the, he's called Mr. Porter's. The, the friend or the lover or whatever. Well, I certainly think it is a direct callback to the Moonstone, which was published in Dickens's magazine all the year round. And uh, one of the things that we learn in writing classes, in, in technical writing classes, if you need, if you need to have some coincidence happen or something unusual happen, you just own it and admit it right up front. 
And I think this is a moment where Dickens is saying, yeah, I know you've read the Moonstone. This is not that, but it's there. I, I just think he's saying it and moving on, but that's, that's the, a writer's take on it. David. Um, I'm reminded of something similar in Great Expectations. Uh, Jagger's clerk, is his name Wemmick? Yes. Has a professional life and a private life. All his fantasy and uh, sociability are in his private life. He and Jagger's, both of them keep up a, a professionalism in the office. So you have a split personality of that sort already in Dickens. Excellent point. Uh, Glenna. I wanted to weigh in again and just say, I don't think that there's any uh, schizoid tendencies in Miss Twinkleton being suggested here, but Dickens is being, I think your point about the Moonstone is excellent. I think the foreshadowing of this theme of the book is there. But uh, he's also kind of having some fun with the fact that most of us do have, I was thinking about myself, the persona I show to my grandchildren is pretty different than the persona that I might show in other circumstances. I mean, this is part of life that we show a persona in one social situation and a different persona in another. And um, Miss Twinkleton, certainly as a you know chaperone and a bringer up of young women has to be so so careful but she has a human side and I don't think there's anything uh Jasper yeah I we don't know about his mental state I don't think there's anything implied um about Miss Kukulton's mental state that's uh billiard Irene You need to unmute, Irene. Uh, I would just like to ask the question, could someone explain this cross-reference to the Moonstone? It's some years since I've read it and I'm not missing completely what people are referring to. Uh, well, I'll just say that someone does something in an altered state and doesn't remember doing it and is brought right. back into an altered mm -hmm. state in order to re recreate something that he did that is deeply embedded in his uh, subconscious. And in that case, it's done through drugs, if I recall. And in this case, if it's done at all, it might be mesmerism or it might be opium or it might be uh, as in the case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, some 17 years, 18 years later, uh, chemistry. So trying not to spoil the book because it's a fantastic book and everyone should read it. Um, but that is what the reference is. Trudy. Thank, thank you. I just, uh, I, want, I want to say thank you again to, to Glenna for saying, I found this scene very humorous right and uh and i and as a, a um spinster <laughs> who was a teacher <laughs> uh and uh you know had a life that my students didn't know about <laughs> or that i tried my best for them not to know about uh, i could relate to this just on an on an everyday scale not you know not as being having anything to do with skits so it's this is just it it's it's both it's just it's both funny the description and it's also something somewhat poignant you know she's she's had a life right well let's talk about rosa and edmund for a little while and then uh then we'll be through the first month's installment um I know some of you are very well read in Dickens and some of you are not. And I know that those of you who are who have been infuriated with Dickens's women. Uh, where does Rosa Bud fit so far in this week's this week month's reading? Where does Rosa Bud fit 
in the exasperation level of Dickens's women. I'm sure some of you have opinions on this. David. She starts out looking like one of the heroines of the early novels, sweet, uh, spineless, uh, without much personality. But as we go along, that turns out to be superficial. She thinks about herself and her place in the world and is prepared to speak up. I think particularly after the visit from Mr. Grugis. Yes, Phyllis. Hi, I, I'm not sure where we stopped. I read the whole thing, I, but um, I won't do any spoilers. Um, but I, I'm glad you raised this question because um, we just got off our mutual friend a while ago. And, and it seems as here we're also getting um, uh, young women um, both the the dark sister from Salon and Rosa um, moving out of roles that, to which they would be assigned in Victorian. We're moving more towards a more modern approach and I won't go into, we'll talk about some more things as the novel progresses, but I, I get this interplay of the railroad and uh, the roles of um, money and power and religion and women are shifting, I think, um, as, as we go along. And I think they're shifting in Dickens's mind as well. well. I do think the woman who sucks on an acidulated drop and then goes and eats lumps of delight is possibly not the same Rosa that we encounter in later chapters. Thank you, fellas. Wayne. Yes, I guess no one's mentioned the portrait in Jasper's rooms, unfinished portrait of Rosa. What would you it's, like to say about it? Well, it appears in two rooms. First, Dickens says it seems to be in the outer room. And then he uh, has the portrait, I think, on the bedroom wall. But its unfinished state suggests, underlines that idea that Rosa is unfinished and immature. And the quality of the portrait of insouciance, I guess, is further suggestive that uh, Rosa will eventually outlive that. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Conrad. Hi, uh, this is Conrad. Um, you know, as I was reading the, the first hundred pages or so, I was thinking that we just finished our mutual friend. And I think it almost seems as if Dickens isn't through with some of the characters from, I think of uh, Rosa Budd as a kind of Bella, an unreconstructed Bella. Uh, is, you know, uh, I think of Jasper, perhaps a Bradley Headstone kind of character, maybe. Uh, we don't know yet. If, you know, I've just read the first 100 pages. And um, Helena, a kind of Lizzie Hexham to um, uh, Helena is to Rosa what Lizzie Hexham was to Bella. And perhaps, you know, I'm not sure. But uh, that, that's what kind of the associations I made, you know, in the first 100 pages or so. Just that's it. Oh, great, thank you. Um, anything else about Rosa and Edwin, about the tenor of that discussion? Um, it's, it's just loaded with, you know, again, these, these uh, em empire, I hesitate to use the word, it would have been in common use at the time, oriental references to uh, even something as mundane as Turkish delight. Uh, always pay attention to the food that is being eaten in this book because it all comes from somewhere else. Uh, and Egypt being an undeveloped country, just waiting for white men to come and fix it. And, I mean, especially for someone like an engineer in training. I mean, you, you do kind of forget because Edwin's such a geek that he is in fact, probably a, a, a talented engineer. Um, let's talk about Mr. Sapsey. That is quite, he is quite a, a, a Dickensian type. Uh, he could be plopped down almost in any book, right down, right back to Pickwick Papers. Um, 
but I, I would like, let's see, who is, who, who do I want to tap? Gwenna, do you have your book open in front of you? Uh, it's right next to me. Would you like to read the epitaph? It, uh, is, it is on page 40 of the penguin. Page 40 in the penguin. Ah. Ethelinda, reverential wife of Mr. Thomas Sapsey, auctioneer, valuer, estate agent, and etc. of this city, whose knowledge of the world, though somewhat extensive, never brought him acquainted with a spirit more capable of looking up to him. Stranger, pause, and ask thyself the question, canst thou do likewise? If not, with a blush, retire. Comments about Mr. Sapsey before we get <laughs> before we get to the plot that happens in this chapter, and there are some significant things that happen in this chapter. But Bill, this is another unreliable report. <laughs> okay. What makes him unreliable? Because you know he's he's seen things. He's seen foreign things have been brought to him, so he knows the world. How, how can you call him unreliable? Goodness, David. <laughs> Dickens is surprisingly explicit in describing Mr. Sapsey as a jackass. <laughs> He doesn't wait for you to find out. He tells you. That is that is true. But something really, a, a big plot point happens there. I guess one could say a big story element happens in this chapter, or at least appears to be important. And what might that be? Isn't, we don't just read for you know the symbols of Miss Twinkleton's celestial and terrestrial glo globes. We have to read for what what's going to happen in the story. Dirtle's discovery of bodies, uh, his ability to find where people are buried, would be my thought. Well, that's certainly one. That's one thing. I think there's another. There's another one that. Uh, that I'm search. I guess I'm fishing for, and that would be the keys. This is when Jasper sees the keys, and um, he gets to hold them. But uh, Dirtles is a little suspicious of Jasper, and so he he doesn't really let him hold on to them very long. But enough for enough for Jasper to figure out which key is which. I think. Um, I pointed out to someone, to Marini, the other day that to pay attention to the clinks that uh, appear in my book. Let's see, where is it in the penguin? Let's see where it is in the penguin. It's near the end. Um, the, the keys clink twice. Okay, page 44. Thank you. Yeah, the keys clink twice. And I was just thinking about I mean, I, I did some research for my Edwin Drood novel about um, stage hypnotists, because one of my characters in the Edwin Drood murders is a stage hypnotist. And the, the ways in which that hypnotic or mesmeric suggestions might be passed along just made me think of those clinks. And we'll certainly come to that um, when we talk about the keynote uh, a little bit later. Um, and then what happens at the end of that chapter? What, what happens when Jasper goes home? I think that's what happens. Nope, that's the end of chapter five, sorry. Okay, so chapter five is when Dirtles and Jasper go walk about and um, we meet deputy. Um, uh, Wayne mentioned earlier the musical, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which I got to see on Broadway in 2014. 
And the conceit of the musical of the mystery of Edmund Drood is that it is set in a music hall setting and the actors are playing the parts of the characters in Edwin Drood. And the musical stops when Dickens stops and then the audience votes on certain who did it and who's this and who's that. And one of the things you have to vote on and who, who are the lovers in the story. And the night that I was there, which apparently is quite popular, the lovers turn out to be Princess Puffer and Deputy. And they get to sing a little ditty together. And, you know, uh, Cheetah Rivera was playing Princess Puffer at the age of 81 or something like that. And the character, the actor playing deputy was, I don't know, 19. It was um, something you get to vote on. But uh, what happens in this chapter? What do we learn about? Anybody? Okay. Quiet on the Western Front. You're talking chapter five? Chapter five, yes. I mean, I do think that the, something that, again, that's important about these clinks, and it's somewhere in the near the end of the chapter where, um, Dirtle says, just you give me my hammer out of that and I'll show you. And then clink, clink, and the hammer is handed to him. And Dirtle says, now looky here, you pitch your note, don't you, Mr. Jasper? Yes. And, and he's talking not about the, the hammer. He's talking about his choir. Um, you pitch your note. I don't know how they did it in the 19th century when I sang barbershop quartet. We used a pitch pipe. And he says, so I sound for mine. So again, we have these sounds that are uh, sort of creepy. Um, and then Jasper goes home and Dickens ends the uh, number with a description of Jasper. Glenna. Well, um, I was just gonna say on page 48, he says, Jasper says, is there anything new down in the crypt? Turtles asks <clears throat> John Jasper which suggests that he is thinking about the inhabitants of the crypt and maybe even how much room there is in the crypt. Definitely. So for those of you who just finished reading Our Mutual Friend, you may or may not know that the readership of Our Mutual Friend dropped off pretty dramatically from the beginning into the end, although it wasn't a failure. I'm going to sneeze in just a minute. Um, although it wasn't a failure, as Sean Grass's wonderful book shows in terms of looking at sales figures and reviews, but it wasn't selling like hotcakes, not like some of Dickens's earlier stories. And I believe the last number sold 30,000 copies. Well, the first issue of Edwin Drood sold 50,000 copies. And so Dickens probably felt, I'm back. It was extremely popular and, and we, it leaves him as exactly where it starts with him drifting into an opium haze. And then the next month or whenever, you know, many people, they, they think many people read these monthly numbers twice. They might've read them the day they came out and then they might've read them again at the end of the month to remind them of what happened before the new one came out on the last day of the next month. And so we now get to um, Canon Chris Barkle and what is going on in this next, in chapter six, which is in the past tense, by the way, Marini. Sorry, I was going back to your earlier question about what happened in chapter five. To me, the, yes, at the end, Jasper is going back into the opium haze, but the creepier thing to me is him, I guess because we already feel like he's creepy, him staring down at, at his nephew, who is a, an, un, his nephew lies asleep, calm and untroubled. And I feel like that contrast the, with Jasper, John Jasper stands looking down upon him 
with a fixed and deep attention. That to me is just super creepy. I mean, I feel like you could read all kinds of terrible things into that um, scene. So anyway, and and then then he smokes his opium and off he goes. But um, it's creepy. It is creepy. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Uh, in chapter six, and I, I maybe it's you know the the tense, we're given a little rest from creepy by uh, meeting the Chris Sparkles at home, um, a lovely kind of family thing, and we're also later, of course, introduced to uh, Helena and Neville is his name, but uh, that line that I just, uh, the line on page fifty five when. Uh, Septimus asks his mom if Mr. Honey Thunder, who is quite a character, he too, I think, Carl, could be plopped down in any Dickens novel. <laughs> yes. Um, said, is he a large man, Ma, Ma? Well, I should call him a large man, my dear, the lady replied after some hesitation, but that his voice is so much larger. I mean, funny, and you can just relax for a few minutes before we have to go back to Jasper. That is an excellent point. Um, of course, I want to bring attention to, let's see, what page is that on? Let's see here, I've got to find, oh, does anyone remember what tea that, that Septimus is drinking? Uh, Sushong, I think. He is, he is drinking. Sushong tea, yes. All right, so I am looking for a particular paragraph, which I am not finding very carefully. It's near the, the end of the chapter. No, it's in the middle of the chapter. Let's see here. Um, I'm looking for a paragraph that begins, Mrs. Chris Barkle's sister. All right, it's at the bottom of page 55. Courtney, do you have your copy in front of you? You don't. John, do you have your copy in front of you? You're muted still, John. Okay. Yes. Could you read the paragraph that starts Mrs. Chris Barkle's sister at the bottom of the page? Mrs. Chris Barkle's sister, another piece of Dresden China, and matching her act. And match and matching her so so neatly that they would have made a delightful pair of ornaments for the two ends of any capacious old-fashioned chimney piece, and by right should never have been seen apart, was the childless wife of a clergyman holding corporation prefer preferment in London City. Mr. Honey. That's, that's all I that's all I wanted. Okay. I just wanted um, if if you've ever seen or read the Agatha Christie novel, A Murder is Announced. It involves a pair of China shepherd and shepherdess lamps. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think that Miss Christie was a fan of Edwin Drood and when she read about the matching uh, China shepherdesses. But what do we have here? We have another pairing. We have uh, two that are, um, they're just matching so neatly that they could be a pair of ornaments. Twins, doubles. Yep, doubles, absolutely. I do want to point out just something. If you have read the, um, if, you, if you've read in the back at the appendices, and you might want to do that, I, some of them are spoilers. So if you don't want to be spoiled, watch, watch out. But there is a suggestion that regarding the development of the railway system, that what Dickens describes in this chapter about no railway to Cloisterham and taking the, um, is it a diligence or an omnibus? I forget. Uh, it's kind of suggests that this novel is probably set before 1846, sometime in the mid 1840s when the railroad was still in its infancy. So, you know, think back to Dombey and Son when the railway was just getting, uh, getting going. Um, but we also, in this chapter, we meet the landless twins. And, and what are they? I mean, first of all, they're twins. But what else are they? Uh, 
anybody. Phyllis. Well, uh, once again, we get the um, ambivalence of uh, relations and their brother and sister, but they sometimes even seem more than that um, in their relationship. And then you get the, the, I think it was another echo from our mutual friend that they come from an exotic um, place where terrible things happen to them. I mean, it's almost like um, something out of the tempest or something that they're, they're another force that's kind of descended that's very different from uh, what's going on up until now. Um, uh, once again, I just want to say that Septimus um, is number seven of the boys that Miss Chris gave birth to and the only one to survive. And they then say, um, Mrs. And they say the mother, not the wife. And, and so you have a rather ambivalent relationship that, that they may be having as well. Thank you. John. As Mr. Podsnap would say, not English. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Um, I'll, I'll just read the paragraph in, let's see, it's on what it page is it on? I should have cross-referenced my edition with this one, but I didn't do it. So it's the paragraph that describes the landlesses. And okay, it's at the bottom of page 58. An unusually handsome, lithe young fellow and an unusually handsome, lithe girl, very uh, much alike, both very dark and very rich in color. She of almost the gypsy type, something untamed about them both, a certain air upon them of hunter and huntress, yet withal a certain air of being the objects of the chase rather than the followers. Slender, supple, quick of eye and limb, half shy, half defiant, fierce of look, an indefinable kind of pause coming and going on their whole expression, both of face and form, which might be equally likened to the pause before a crouch or a bound. The rough mental notes made in the first five minutes by Mr. Crisparkle would have read thus, a verbatim. And in the next paragraph, he says, um, much as if they were beautiful barbaric captives brought from some wild tropical dominion, not English indeed. What kind of imagery is that? PM. Anybody? Lena? Mute myself. Well, among other things, <laughs> by, by our current standards, it's profoundly racist. Um, and, you know, very colonial in feeling. I also think that this is one of the moments when the Moonstone is being most closely recalled because of the, um, you know, the characters who are Indian in the Moonstone. Um, and I found it very, it's interesting. I read this novel the first time when I was about 20, and then I didn't reread it until the universe of 2013, which I couldn't participate in because I had a hip replaced. And now rereading it this time, this time I'm more disturbed by the language than I was in 2013. I'm not sure why, but when um, Neville refers to himself as tigerish, for example, I find this very upsetting. And that's all. Bill. I was going to make some of the same points uh, that Glenna did. Uh, my recollection is that um, Ceylon has, uh, in these days, uh, a group that's rebellious uh, against the established government that goes by the name of Tigers. Um, and I don't know whether that was also the case in Dickens' day, but uh, these descriptions are make the the landless twins come across very much as animals, uh, and um, <clears throat> I, they refer to themselves as having blood. the 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 way that race is handled here is um, certainly out of step with our contemporary thinking in many ways and um, troubling. I, you know, I did dipped 
barely into the salon history and realized that it was not something that one can read in 20 minutes, but it, had, it changed hands many times. It's unclear, of course, exactly of what extraction the landlesses are. They, they might have been British subjects taken over there. They might have are born over there of English parents. They might be mixed race. You just don't know. They're certainly dark, other, exotic, all the terms were oriental or terms we're trying not to use. In the Broadway adaptation, as uh, Sharon Weltman mentioned in her lecture that year, uh, the landlesses were played in the most extremely offensive uh, tropes, uh, right down to curled slippers and uh, brocaded uh, harem pants and that sort of thing. And a uh, brown face that was obvious. You could see it, probably see it from the balcony. Um, and I think that was done deliberately to emphasize the music hall nature and the time that was uh, the setting that was intended to be. But it was, it was definitely offensive. Uh, David. Dickens is rather careful in describing them. There's a strong suggestion, not clearly, stated that they have what used to be called a touch the tar brush uh some blood other than english but he's working i think to avoid um giving any food for readers like mr podsnap who would podsnap who would say not english and put them behind him, he, he, he avoids, he makes them a bit foreign, but he's not, he's not making them too much other. Well, as we find out though, in the next chapter, Neville has his own thoughts about that, but first let's find out what Phyllis has to say. Well, I just wanted to say at the end of that passage you read, Carl, the, uh, Dickens gives himself a little cover uh, that it was the rough metal notes made in the first five minutes by Mr. Chris Sparkle would have read thus verbatim. An excellent I, point. One thing that we always talk about when in writing classes is that when a character says something or describes another character, we are learning two things. We are learning something about the character and we're also learning something about the person who's doing the describing and the lens that they're looking at from. And that's an excellent point. Thank you so much. Verity. Just an, one, I agree with everything that Glennie said that, you know, looking at it through our eyes these days, it's unsavory. Um, but we get some insight into their um, psychology through um, Neville telling uh, Mr. Chris Park all about his brutal stepfather who beat Helena in front of him. I don't know whether he did that to torture Neville or just did it, but um, that's another explanation for the, the fierceness of them, I mean, and they also say, I think it's Neville who says, we actually planned to run away when we got here. I mean, the, these are, are kids who have been hurt and who were desperate and who were <coughs> sticking together, um, who unexpectedly find themselves, they think, in <laughs> a savory um, situation. We'll see how that works out. I, I totally agree, uh, Phyllis. Well, another, uh, our mutual friend, Echo, um, Helena has has mastered the world or will master this world more quickly than her brother. And she is hoping her brother will um, manage to do it, that she's the stronger of the two, a la the same thing with Lizzie and her brother, um, though in a different setting, but she's, she's figuring out the world for him. And uh, this there's another brother sister thing duology again I mean duality again too well I'm not going to read all of it but I think page 64 is some magnificent dialogue it is expository in nature but it doesn't feel clunkish the way exposition often feels 
But I think what's most important, at least for identifying Neville in particular, is, is the paragraph in the, in the center of the page where he says, and to finish with, sir, I have been brought up among abject and servile dependents of an inferior race, and I may easily have contracted some affinity with them. Sometimes I don't know, but that it may be a drop of what is tigerish in their blood. So it's a mystery. With whom does Neville identify? And I think that the, everything gets even more confusing when we look at the illustration, which I just had, uh, opposite page 76 in the Penguin. And remember that Dickens had extreme input on the way that these characters looked. And so how do, how do they appear to look to us? How, how would you describe these three men in terms of their demeanor, uh, their power positions, and their, frankly, their racial characteristics. If only Christian were here, he could talk for half an hour, I'm sure, on this illustration alone. But let's, uh, Ernie. You're muted. Excuse me. Yeah, it looked to me, it kind of looks like um, that the two druids are, are teaming up against uh, the other fellow there. And, you know, Neville, and to me, Neville seems like the most reasonably looking guy there. Now, I don't know how to put that in terms of, you know, their races or their anything like that, but I, he seems to be. I mean, because we, I don't know what Jasper's thing is, but he seems to be saying, well, this guy here is, you know, got all this. And I, it seems like they're just laying it on Neville to me. Certainly that is, is, is part. But I think, you know, we've been, we've been told that Jasper is dark and we've been told that Neville is dark. Edwin Drood is clearly white as white can be with kind of a boyish, embarrassment of a mustache, uh, even big eyelashes, oddly enough. And he is, of course, poised in, in a, a very um, sort of devil-may-care position. Wayne. Well, this may be off the wall, but I, several people have uh, Rosa ending up with Neville. I don't want to anticipate too much, but uh, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to imagine, but. It's not hard for Neville to imagine it. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> he's got her, he's zeroed in on her right away, very clearly. But again, we have these two men who've been described as dark and and then it's very clear that the best description of Drood, who says, I think, a little bit later, um, you are no judge of white men, which I, I think that comes <laughs> very quickly on. So it's pretty clear that Edwin sees Neville as an other. Not clear whether he sees Jasper in that same way. Wayne, did you have something else you wanted to say? Oh, no, no, thank you. All right. Okay, so um, then uh, the, the creepiness comes back on. Um, let's see here. Um, the creepiness comes back on back, we we'll go back a little bit at the piano. Again, another great illustration opposite page <laughs> six, where we have virtually all of the main characters uh, identified here. So we have Neville on the left, Jasper, then Rosa, then Helena, 
then I think Miss Twinkleton uh, drew being very Oscar Wildean by holding fan and uh, Chris Barkle and his mother looking sort of like a Mount Rushmore figure there on the far right. <laughs> um, but you can see that Helen has got her eye on, she's given him the eye, she's given Jasper the eye. Jasper's tilted toward Rosa. It is unclear. Um, Neville appears to be looking at Rosa. And God only knows what was on Drood's mind at that moment. He is apparently staring at the back of Helena's head. And that may be a setup for what we're expected to have happen later. Um, but later, late in that chapter, late in chapter seven, Rosa has um, maybe a flash of the character of, of the woman that we would like to have in a Dickens novel when she talks very frankly and plainly about realistically, she and Edwin are ridiculous together. We are a ridiculous couple. Um, and she says at about the same time um, that Jasper haunts my thoughts like a dreadful ghost. I feel that I am never safe from him. I feel as if he could pass in through the wall when he has spoken of, and later on that final page and a half, he has made me a slave with his looks. When he corrects me and strikes a note or a chord or plays a passage, he himself is in the sounds, whispering that he pursues me as a lover and commanding me to keep his secret. And then later, uh, he watched my lips so closely as I was singing. Besides feeling terrified, I felt ashamed and passionately hurt. It was as if he kissed me and I couldn't bear it, but cried out. So, Marini, I think this is super more creepy um, than, than the, the previous <laughs> one. And I think it was um, Conard maybe who made the comparison between Bradley Headstone and Jasper. I think that, that Jasper way outflanks Bradley Headstone, although he did ham uh, break his or injure his wrist or his knuckles on, on the wall when he was so sexually frustrated at seeing Eugene. Um, I, I do think this is a leap forward uh, in, in sophistication of Dickens being able to try and deal with uh, sexual jealousy and sexual, uh, what's the word, um, obsession. Irene. Uh, I just feel that every time I read that one, I see Phantom of the Opera. I can't help thinking that Lloyd Webber has really borrowed very strongly from this scene in creating the Phantom of the Opera, that, uh, the behavior and, uh, of, of Jasper and, and the attitude of Rosa. And LaRue's book is what, 1880s, 1890s? It's definitely after Drood. So mm -hmm. in chapter eight then we have um, the, the, the mixing of the drinks. Um, And uh, that's when we have uh, the sort of the, the breakup of the, the two, the fight between the two men and Jasper playing the peacemaker, but I'm not sure we believe that for any period of time. Is there any doubt in your mind what, what action is going on in this chapter? Even if you may not know why it's going on. Anyone care to comment on that? Well, no, then we shall move on. We've discussed the, the, um, I, oh, there's one more thing I wanna bring up. And that is, let me see here. It is a phrase that I cannot quite recall. But Neville, for some reason, and it's, it's one of those phrases that you could read the book four or five times and you wouldn't notice it. Um, so Neville is, is um, out walking before Chris Barfield catches up with him. And the narrator tells us some wildly passionate ideas of the river dissolve under the spell of the moonlight on the cathedral and graves 
and the remembrance of his sister and the thought of what he owes to the good man who has but that very day won his confidence, blah, blah, blah. I read this book seven or eight times and it wasn't until yesterday that I caught that some wildly passionate ideas of the river because the river is going to play some role in this book, not this week, but soon. And I, again, I wonder whether that is one of those little bits of uh, breadcrumbs that, that Dickens has set for himself in case he needs it later. So our last chapter of the day, and we are closing in on our time, goes back to past tense. And um, we learn, we, we do learn about um, what has happened with Grugis. And of course, there's some complex backstory here in that, um, that Rosa goes to see Grugis and Grugis tells her a little bit, what's the, what's the impact of that, that uh, chapter to you? Again, we're coming up, this is the end of the second installment. So what is it that Dickens wants us, what story questions does Dickens wants us, want us to leave with for the next month? Trudy. You're, you're muted, Trudy. I mean, what I appreciated in this was first of all, that Rosa uh, basically says, it's up to me, you know? <laughs> um, uh, that I need to talk to Edwin about this. You, uh, she, she takes, uh, she takes some charge of her situation there, and then obviously what we're looking forward to is Edwin's return right before Christmas. Right, he's already left, so she can't do anything. She can't about... do anything, but he's coming at Christmas, and she says, you know, to Mr. Grugius, you know, I, I'm not going to commit to anything until I've talked to him. Right? Isn't that pretty much what she's saying? Um, yes, and of course, she wants him to come back. She to wants him to be there. To be there, although she doesn't say for what specifically. Well, he seems to be, I, lo I love his little list of things that he ticks off. But, you know, I mean, he seems to be the one that, um, that draws the legal documents. So whether or not, you know, and he's told her, you don't, the law will not force you to marry this guy. Um, but uh, if, if she talks to Edwin and they discuss the situation and they come to some kind of a resolution, Grugius would be the one who would uh, draw up any kind of agreement. Right, and we will find out next month what happens when Grugius and Edwin meet. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Uh, so uh, what stood up for me in this section is, um, uh, when she describes uh, how Jasper has this mesmerizing looks at her, like he tells her everything between us is a secret, you cannot tell anybody. But now in this chapter's interviews, she specifically tells him, don't involve him, I'm scared of him. Mm -hmm. So she's telling the secret mm -hmm. that she was warned not to tell, which I thought is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Phyllis. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, this is just, I, I, again, I just saw this right now for the third time looking through this. Um, at the beginning of this chapter, it says, Rosa, having no relation that she knew of in the world, had from the seventh year of her age known no home but the nun's house and no mother but Miss Twinkleton. And it's almost as if she is now acting on that realization that she has no one else but herself to rely on, and it empowers her. Um, it, it doesn't frighten her. Uh, again, there's the whole, um, my father who was orphaned by the age of 13, used to say the best way to raise a child is to orphan him. And uh, <laughs> uh, there is a certain sense of that, that there's a certain liberation when you don't have the parents telling you who you're gonna marry, you know, so. 
there is what um I, I forget who oh we've got somebody who is who needs to be muted Courtney can you find that who that is um so there is a moment near the end of the chapter that I, it, one of those moments that only Charles Dickens, I think, could write. Miss Twinkleton here achieved a curtsy, suggestive of marvels happening to her respective legs, and which she came out of nobly three yards behind her starting point. Who could not think of Fezziwig's winking legs from A Christmas Carol at the moment that um, Miss Twinkleton marvels happening to her respective legs. Um, all right, we are coming up to the end of our time today. So at the end, Grugis tells Jasper that the young people are going to manage this on their own. And um, I guess, I guess Mr. Grew just says when she says she she don't want us, don't you know? And Jasper says, you mean me? And Grew just says, I mean us. And Jasper says, God save them both. And Grew just says, I said bless them. And Jasper says, is there any difference? Uh, what might that mean? What what is that? Again, that's what Dickens leaves us with. Is that a moment of suspense, uh, fear? What's, what's the emotion that you leave with as you finish today's reading? Anybody? Well, um, it's exactly what you say in the sense that Mr. You get the sense that Rosa is taking control of things and this wonderful Mr. The Angular Man is a very honorable, reliable um, ally. And so you could almost say, oh, well, so whew, we, we dodged that bullet. But no, it's not gone. It's it's there. It's we can't we can't say things are going to move along after that uh, last line, I think. Well, we are running short of time and we have walked through today's pages. What questions or comments did you not get a chance to make that you would love to make? You're burning to talk for the next 10 minutes. Uh, David. You're, you're muted, David. God bless them versus God save them. I have the feeling with Jasper all this while that he is split in his decision about what he is going to do. The, the God save them is partly from me. Interesting. I hadn't, uh, you know, I hadn't thought of that. That's a great interpretation. Cynthia, did you have your hand up? I was just thinking about that save versus bless and that the save means they are in great peril. And only Jasper knows how much peril they're in. Thank you. Glenna. Yeah, I was going to say the same. I think... Um, I think <clears throat> these last couple of chapters where we see the fero ferocity of uh, Neville's temper. And so that's gonna be a, a plot element to add a little bit of mystery, one would assume. Um, and then you, I mean, what could be creepier than this man who's obsessed and now says, God save them. I think it's a very creepy moment. Thank you, Sarah. You're muted. You asked about things that we would have liked to talk more about. So yeah. one thing that I wanted to talk is when Drood and Jasper are together and they have the conversation and Jasper tries to warn him and mm -hmm. Drood's reaction is very interesting. Like totally he doesn't get it. He's totally naive. And he says, there will be no problem, whatever, because I am going to marry and live to Egypt. 
So, so he's totally not suspicious. Uh, so I thought it was very interesting, yeah. Thank you. Dorothy. I can't see whether you're talking. You're, you're, you're not, or you're muted. Muted, oh. I unmuted. Now, yes, now you're unmuted. It keeps coming up mute. Oh, dear. Anyway, in speaking of Rosa becoming a strong woman, this concept that she and Edwin had to marry, one would have thought this, this had been going on for years and bothered Edwin, but nobody except Rosa thought to ask about the actual meaning of the will. And it was she then who finds from Grugis that no, it's not required, it was just hoped. And I thought that was interesting that nobody, Edwin and others had inquired more deeply into this codicil of the will. Well, why would they? They're sort of like uh, in Vanity Fair, George and Amelia have always assumed because their parents wished it that they would get married. And I think Rosa and Edwin always just assumed they were going to get married until they realized they didn't love one another. And that would, and then and only then did they wonder, well, do I have to? I, I didn't find that peculiar. No. Well, it's the Rosa who inquires. Yes. Edwin doesn't. I agree. And I think that's part of what makes Rosa uh, more interesting, perhaps, than, than Lucy Manette in some parts of Tale of Two Cities. Uh, that she is thinking for herself and she is of the two of them probably the more savvy an adult thinker at the moment yes irene yes um i'm thinking that thinking that uh, rosa is in a different position from edwin I get the impression from the way he talks that he expects to be lording it over Rosa in a future marriage. And Rosa is much more aware of what she will lose in that marriage. And she, that's why she's the one who asks. I certainly think that Edwin has unexamined privilege. He simply assumes, although he doesn't have any, well, we don't know whether he's a man of the world, if you know what I mean. Uh, he he doesn't act like one, he acts like a boy. And, but he also has that, that male privilege that is, I think, unexamined. And Rosa is definitely the more savvy of the two. Well, we have reached the end of our time today and you guys have all been wonderful and perceptive readers. And I hope that we will see you at the same time, whenever Courtney has uh, announced the next meeting, which is, uh, let me see, it is uh, Sunday, April 26th at, yes. 1, at 1 p.m. And we will be reading uh, whatever pages Courtney sent out It'll be the next two monthly numbers. So through monthly number chapter, monthly number four, which is roughly page 186 in the- in April rather than March? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I went way too far ahead in my, yes, March, March 20, March 26th. Yes, and we will read through page 180 whatever I just said, 186, chapter 16. And we will finish up then the following month, including a discussion of who did it if anything was done. Thank you so much. You have been wonderful and we will see you next month. Thank, Thank you. Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl.